and this is the second lecture in the series of a few for aortic regurgitation. In this particular lecture, we'll be exploring common presentations for aortic regurgitation, whether they be congenital and acquired. We can address the mechanism behind regurgitation that we're actually seeing for these pathologies. And then we'll demonstrate some typical echocardiographic findings. Why do we see aortic regurgitation? As part of an aging process, we see a lot of sclerosis and fibrosis associated with the aortic valve. Over time, a significant scarring and then a body process of healing that scarring leads to calcification. This calcification can be accelerated by genetic predisposition, diet, lifestyle, and smoking. And uh, renal dysfunction and abnormal calcium metabolism may also accelerate this process. Calcification forms along the commissures, but mostly at the base of the leaflets, which leads to an inability for the leaflets to coapt effectively. Most common aortic regurgitation is mild or trivial and arises from the centre of the valves where all three leaflets coapt. The direction of the jet is also usually central. Hypertension plays an effect. Basically, the higher the blood pressure, the more significant the jet. The greater the driving force is actually forcing it into the ventricle. The duration of flow and the length of the jet are typically increased in hypertension. The aortic root may dilate to create aortic regurgitation. Consider a door frame getting larger, but the door staying the same size. In doing so, the valve just can't be effective in closing and stopping regurgitation. Aortic root dilatation at the sinus of the salve has this effect. Additionally, the support structure for the aortic valve extends up into the ST junction level. In some instances of aortic root dilatation, there is a facement of the ST junction, so the aortic root and the ascending aorta look as a continuous single tube. Aortic regurgitation is highly probable in this instance. A typical onion bulb appearance to the root and the ascending aorta is seen in Marfan syndrome and other connective tissue disorders. It is important to note that other valves are often affected and the mitral valve is more likely to exhibit prolapse. And here we have an example of a facement of the ST junction level where we just see a continual line running up from the leaflet insertion point into the ascending aorta. So we know that the ST junction level is the support structures, the insertion point for the leaflets, and so by pulling that apart, it weakens the aortic valve and means it's not able to coapt effectively. And in this example here, we have Marfan's disease, so a typical onion bulb kind of look to the aortic root. So large and bulbous here, and this dimension here is quite significant. And then we have a tapering down to the ascending aorta size. Aortic dissection is a dangerous condition where the intimate layer of the aorta may be separated from the aortic wall. Consider the intimate being like wallpaper and someone sliding their hand between it and the wall, separating the two surfaces. It is important to note that the dissection not always travels away from the heart and further down the aorta. In some instances, the dissection travels back into the aortic root. In doing so, it lifts the support structure of the aortic valve. The valve effectively becomes floppy, unable to support itself, and in significant cases can actually uh, prolapse back down into the left ventricular outflow tract. And this is what we're actually seeing here. We've had a dissection that's come down and the support has now been lost to the aortic valve and it prolapses into the ventricle. And it's not surprising when we turn colour on, we've actually got a significant amount of regurgitation, a lot of flow going down backwards into the ventricle. With our bicuspid aortic valves, from the short axis view, the commissure may be horizontal, oblique, or vertical. Uh, typically, we see aortic root and ascending aorta dilatation, and we have a higher incidence of coarctation of the aorta. 
The aortic root forms a circular appearance in true congenital bicuspid valves, and this differs from the usual cloverleaf representation. Placing colour over the valve may be helpful in distinguishing bicuspid valves as a cat's eye appearance is seen with the colour flow. This is particularly useful when the leaflet commissure is not easily seen. Often one leaflet is dominant in size over the other, as now there are only two insertion points into the SG junction level instead of three, which means there is less support to the valve. As a result, there is usually aortic regurgitation and the jet itself is fairly eccentric. And what we can see here is a very posteriorly directed aortic regurgitation associated with the bicuspid valve. The flow moves very much directly down and then hits onto the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. This is a good example of the Austin Flint murmur. And we can also see that represented with M mode. We have our normal mitral, um, mitral movement profile associated with the M mode. Except for this component here, we can see this fluttering, this thickening of the mitral valve, where the mitral valve is trying to open, but at the same time is being forced downwards by the aortic regurgitation. And here we can see the typical cat's eye appearance when we apply with colour. So this vertical slit as blood moves through the orifice. Variants include monocuspid and quadricuspid valves, which are relatively quite rare. And in this instance here, we have an example of a monocuspid valve. So the only actual orifice is here, and everything else is actually fused up. In this instance here, it all looks fairly benign, except for we can see a reasonable amount of aortic regurgitation moving down into the ventricle. The leaflet coaptation point is relatively centred, so we wouldn't normally assume a bicuspid valve. However, when we turn to short axis, it's evident we've actually got a quadricuspid aortic valve with a typical cross-like appearance. And we can see, as expected, that the actual aortic regurgitation is fairly central in its origin. Rheumatic aortic valve disease represents about 12% of isolated cases where it just involves the aortic valve. The most common form that we see is coexisting mitral valve disease. This uh, form of stenosis is different in that we have a characteristic zipper-like effect arising from the base of the commissures. These points of coaptation are points of irritation that aggravate the inflammatory process associated with the rheumatic disease. As the basis of the commissures move the least, these first fuse which slowly work towards the centre of the valve. Sclerosis and calcification along the commissures create stenosis, but also leads to the leaflet unable to coapt appropriately and therefore aortic regurgitation. And we can see that quite clearly here on the valve. The effective orifice area is quite small, and we've got this thickened and calcified, roughened looking commissure. Isolated prolapse is actually a relatively common pathology and in most cases affects the right coronary cusp. It is often missed by sonographers who are not aware of the specific features that demonstrate the mechanism of this form of aortic regurgitation. The main body of the aortic valve is held by its support and coapts normally. It is the tip of the leaflet that prolapses. When viewing from a parasternal long axis view, the cusp will have a backward three look to it. to indicate the competent and prolapsing components. In the parasternal short axis view, careful panning through the valve by the user will identify a line running across the leaflet, distinguishing the point of prolapse. In this example of right coronary cusp prolapse, the aortic regurgitation will be eccentric and posteriorly directed. It is important to, for a sonographer not to fall in the trap of a fixed mindset to assess the aortic regurgitation by continuous wave, the best alignment might actually be achieved from this parasternal long axis view and not from the apical window. And here we have an example of the prolapse isolated from the right coronary cusp. We get this 
back to front three appearance. So the normal competent part of the valve that's coapting normally and the prolapsing tip of the leaflet. So not surprisingly, we get this torrential and significant, very eccentric, posteriorly directed angle regurgitation. Then when we move to the short axis view, we can see our leaflets co-apting, but here we have the line running across the valve. So this part is supported normally, and this part here is prolapsing. So what we see with the color is a posteriorly directed jet, but we also see this blue going to red because we've actually got a spiral effect. It's coming down, hitting the LVT and rifling down the LVIT and into the ventricle. Right coronary cusp prolats and bicuspid of valves often have eccentric jets that create an Austin flint murmur. The posteriorly directed jet hits the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve, which is tend to open in diastole and allow ventricular. At the same time, the aortic valve regurgitation is pushing it down. Typical fluttering of the anterior leaflet is seen within mode. In the parasternal lung axis view, a reverse doming of the anterior leaflet may actually be seen in diastole. And again here we can see this fluttering of the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. Infective endocarditis can be devastating to a valve. Vegetations form which are effectively infective blood clots around sites of activity. The infection can lead to leaflet perforation and aortic regurgitation occurring through the body of the leaflet rather than through leaflet tips or along the commissures. Vegetations tend to be mobile and get in the way of the leaflets, forming good coaptation. And vegetations are typically seen on the ventricular aspect of the valve. An abscess may form around the annulus which may disrupt the support of the leaflet, which in turn leads to aortic regurgitation. What's worse is the abscess may also rupture, first on the aortic side and then on the ventricular side, leading to free-flowing aortic regurgitation. A ruptured abscess may also have further effect for uh, disrupting the support structure for the aortic valve. Triggers for Loeffler or non-infective endocarditis include hyperinosinophilic syndrome, eosinophilic leukemia, carcinoma, lymphoma, and drug reactions or parasites. There are other forms of aortic regurgitation we need to consider. Radiation therapy can cause the leaflets to become sclerosed and retracted and therefore lead to aortic regurgitation. There are certain medications that are known to cause aortic regurgitation. Fenfluramine, fentermin, what used to be called fenfen, and this was taken off the market in 1997. Similarly, with those drugs containing ergotamine uh, had problems with the valve where they actually destroy the connective tissue and the structure that therefore supports the body of the leaflets. Trauma may also lead to aortic regurgitation of whether they actually be from direct impact hitting the valve or a sudden shearing motion that creates a jolt to the body. In summary, there are numerous representations and forms of aortic regurgitation. The discerning sonographer must be able to distinguish them and demonstrate the mechanism for the aortic regurgitation and the secondary findings that will be associated with them. Emode has reduced application in the current ESCO exam. However, it's still useful in the assessment of aortic regurgitation as it's even able to demonstrate regurgitation without the use of colour.